If you are a brand new Canon R10 user, you are about to learn all of the buttons and controls of your camera. You're also going to learn what these symbols, icons, and numbers mean. You will learn exposure control settings, including aperture and shutter speed. You will learn what ISO is, including the drawbacks of turning it up too high and when to use it. You will learn the how, when, and where of your focusing modes and when you should change them. You're also going to learn your metering modes, your drive modes. You're going to learn about white balance. You are also going to learn about eye detection, a killer feature for portrait photographers. And I'm even going to throw in a ton of bonus information. Hi, my name is Michael Andrew, and I'm about to give you your free tutorial on the brand new Canon R10. A couple resources I want to give you before we get started is to check out the link in the description below for our Facebook group. The Facebook group allows me to interact with you and other users. And the best feature I think about it is you can use the search bar to look up lenses that you're interested in to see the results that other users are getting. It's like a library where you can check out to see a lens result before you buy the lens. So it helps with research. And it also allows us to discuss any problems that we might find with the camera. In some cases, I have taken that information, made a video, and we have seen a change from Canon. That has happened a couple times. If you're an experienced shooter or you just want to browse the topics, check out the table of contents in the description. You can also go Control F or Command F, type the keyword that you're interested in. And if we have it in our table of contents, it will highlight the chapter marker and you can click on that and it'll take you straight to the lesson. Now I know many of you are probably pure beginners if we're dealing with the Canon R10. I have to give you a word of warning. This video will not be enough for you to take consistently great images. This video deals with the operation of the camera only. And to be consistent, there's a number of other things you have to learn like the basics of photography, the basics of lighting, the basics of composition, and then you start getting into the different technical aspects of shooting sports versus landscape versus portrait versus video or strobe. So there's a ton of information outside of this video. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is sort of like an interview is I'm going to give you the best possible course right now on the operation of the camera, which buttons do what and things of that nature. If you like my teaching style and you're ready to invest in yourself to take it to the next level, you're going to want to check out my Canon R10 crash course. If you're watching this, it's in production right now, or hopefully we'll be finished in four to five weeks. Take a look at the link in the description. If it's not ready, it'll take you to my blog where you can leave your name and your email address, and we will contact you as soon as it's ready. We typically post it online. And again, it takes about four to six weeks to, to shoot it. It's a lot of work that goes into that. Stick around to the end of the video. I will also give you some accessories and lens recommendations. We have a tremendous amount of information to cover. So let's get started. First, let me say thank you guys for coming. I am thrilled to be your instructor. And for those of you that have a little bit of experience with cameras, check out the table of contents. I know sometimes I get comments like, why are you walking us through some of these basic stuff? Some of you are pure beginners and I build from easiest to more complex in a very particular order. There's a reason for it. So if this is moving too slow for you, just use those table of contents. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put a shoe on the bottom of our camera. Also wanna just give you some encouragement. Just be really patient, take your time. Learning photography is sort of like riding a bike. It's frustrating at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty straightforward. So this is how we set the camera up onto a tripod and I can lock and rotate if you're doing a lot of landscape photography, group photos, product photography, try to get a ball head just like this. Let's talk real quick about putting lenses on to our camera and also talk a little bit about the sensor. It's a 24 megapixel crop sensor. This is where it is. A little bit smaller than full frame. You'll notice we have this red mark here on the RF mount that aligns with our cap. Those are alignment marks to tell us where to put the cap on. And we're also going to have a similar red marker, it's right here. So when we're putting a lens on, we're gonna line up these red marks and rotate it till it clicks. To take the lens off, we're going to push and rotate in the opposite direction. Always try to give it a little wiggle when I put it on there. 
So this is a 50 millimeter 1.8. It's referred to as a nifty 50. This is for the RF mount. There is an EF version that it was like a hundred dollars. And if you have the adapter and you have that lens, you might as well just adapt it over. But this is a native RF mount, really a great lens. And the reason I point this out is because we have a 1.6 X magnification crop factor because we're using a smaller sensor. So what this means is we take that 1.6 and we multiply it times the focal length of any lens we put on to this camera. So that 50 millimeter times 1.6 becomes an 80 millimeter lens, which is a perfect focal length for portraits. 1.8 refers to how wide the aperture can open. It's a very wide aperture lens, so it's going to let in a lot of light. We'll be talking about that later. A quick note on lens hygiene or, is that when you're changing your lenses, always try to do it with the sensor facing down. This will help reduce the amount of sensor dust that will appear. And also when you change your lenses, try to do it quickly. We don't wanna leave this open and exposed for long periods of time. It's gonna happen sooner or later, but I will show you how to clean it on the crash course. Something else I wanna point out is that every lens cap should have the lens size under the lens cap. So we can read here 43 millimeters. You'll need that size to buy any filters, ND filters, polarizers, adapters, and that's how you figure it out. And many lenses also have it written on there. There's a little, there's a little O with a line through it. That's your filter size. So we're gonna put the battery in, and if you look inside, the pins that line up with the battery are closest to the camera body. So always remain, remember the pins go closest to the camera body. This is an LPE 17 battery. I would strongly, strongly recommend buying at least one extra. The battery capacity can run out on long shoots, something you just need to keep, keep aware of. And something else you'll notice is that we have our card slot right here. If you look right here in the bottom corner, it's kind of hard to see, we have a little outline of a memory card and it's giving us the orientation of how to put it in. We've got to cut one of these cut corners here, right? So it would go into the camera like this. You push it until it clicks. All this said, memory cards are not created equal. I have two different memory cards here. They look almost exactly the same, aside from the, from the size. So if you look at the speeds of the memory card, they're completely different. And in the very, very fine print, we can see this one is a UHS class two, and this is a UHS class one. When we look at the back, you'll see that the UHS class two memory card has two rows of pins. That's how you remember UHS-2, right? And the truth of the matter is, if you're using 4K video, the minimum certification here, it's hard to see, it says U3. Class U3 is the minimum standard for 4K sustained writing speeds. So people think, why don't I just get a UHS class one card, U3, you can do that, no problem. But the difference you're really going to notice when you're using these cards is the performance of the UHS-2 card. It really makes a difference if you're doing, for example, 4K 60 frames, or if you're doing sports shooting, what will happen is the buffer of the camera will fill up. You'll shoot multiple shots and, and the camera will slow down or it'll stop completely. A UHS class two memory card, this one's a speed V90 is much faster of clearing the buffer. So you can get back into the shooting much quicker. This is the card that I'm recommending for you. The UHS-2 class card, V90, SanDisk Extreme. Spend a little bit of money. I think I spent $130 on this one. Has 128 gigabytes. Literally thousands of JPEG images, no problem. Hours of 4K video. And if you're on a tight budget, then you're gonna go with maybe a UHS class one card. 64 or 128 gigabytes u3 v30 but this is the one that i recommend the sandisk extreme pro uhs2 speed v90 and they have different sizes of storage you only got one card and you know in the beginning i used one memory card for shooting weddings very rarely did i have any problems uh, in fact only one time and it wasn't for a paid job so that's our battery and our memory card real quickly we're going to go over all the buttons and controls Obviously the shutter button, super important. Something you'll notice about it is that it has two positions. There's a halfway spongy resistance that will allow the camera to focus. And when we push it down all the way, it'll take the picture. It's almost like a click. Next to the shutter button on the inside, we have a little light or a lamp here. 
This will flash when we're using our timer and it will also act as our focus assist lamp in dark situations. Down here underneath the grip where our right ring finger would rest, we have an AF, which stands for autofocus, M stands for manual. It's compatible with certain RF lenses. And in the middle of it, we have a depth of field preview button. RF lenses will often have these different switches. This one is saying focus. So if I have this switch to focus, it's gonna control the focus of the ring. When it's on control, I can customize the ring to do different things like exposure compensation, ISO, white balance. We can program this in our custom dial setting. We've already talked about the lens release here. Under these rubber gaskets on the left side of the camera as we hold it, we have a few important ports. This is the microphone port. If you're doing any kind of video work, you're definitely going to want to use an external microphone and this is where we plug in. That will record the audio to the video file that's being recorded. Next to it, we have a remote port. And under the second one, we have our HDMI out and we also have a USB-C terminal. So some of you will be asking about whether or not this port will charge. Canon has a USB accessory charger. My understanding is it, it requires a certain amount of power to get this to work, or at least for it to display that it's charging, but I'm sure we'll learn more about it with time. There is a built-in flash. We access it by grabbing on the sides and just pulling up. Don't pull too hard, but there it is. I don't consider this a professional flash, but if you need some fill light, it's better than nothing. And I'll definitely show you how to use this on the crash course. So on the top of the camera, we have our microphone inputs. This is a stereo input. The problem with the microphone on the camera is as the motors move the lens, as you grip it and hold it, the vibrations will transfer to the audio and you'll be able to hear it. It also doesn't really pick up sound that great. Obviously the shutter button. This guy here, I like to refer to as the primary selector. And I'll talk about why I like to call it that. And back here, the thumb wheel, I like to call the secondary selector. These are very important because you'll be using them to change your exposure settings often. This guy right here, the multi-function button, will help us open some of our secondary controls and settings. The red dot button is the video record button. We have a lock button. The mode dial designate the behavior of the camera, what it will change versus what we will change. And we obviously have the power switch on and off right here. Underneath the viewfinder, it's hard to see, it's a little lever that slides to the left and right. This is the diopter adjustment. And the idea of this is to change the focus of the viewfinder for those of us, including myself, that wear corrective eyewear. So if you're wearing contacts or glasses, this will help you focus the camera, very important. This is our deep menu button. We'll be talking about this in a second free tutorial that I'll be putting on YouTube. We'll go into pretty much all the features and at least briefly to explain what they each do. This is our joystick, which is going to allow us to change our focusing square. It can also be used for other types of navigation. This is our AF on button, also our back button focusing. The star refers to the exposure lock or the flash exposure lock if we're using a flash. This second button is what I call the cluster selector button, which will allow us to choose different focusing squares. One of the most common questions I get from beginners is in regards to how to cycle through different screens on our back monitor. You do it by pushing the info button. Just push the info button. I'll demonstrate this in just a moment. We also have this directional pad, up, down, left, right, and there's a button in the middle. So each of these, if you push them in a certain direction, it is going to do a function according to the icon that it gives. To the left, this is our drive modes. The drive mode tells the camera what to do after we push a shutter button down all the way, whether it's a single shot, multiple burst, or a timer. Up is our ISO. ISO deals with the amount of boost that we're giving to the light coming into the camera. And in dark situations, we'll increase it. And in brighter situations, we'll decrease it. Talk a lot about this a lot later. Here we have our flash mode. We have a garbage can icon. Anything in blue, deals with playback. So this is the playback button, obviously, but a blue garbage can means we can delete that image 
when we're playing back. You'll also notice here on the side, there's this little blue magnifying glass. And that means that while we are playing images back, if you push this button, it will magnify, but you can also pinch and zoom using our fingers as we would on a smartphone. I'm gonna set up the date and time real quick. You'll see something similar to this when you first get your camera. It's pretty straightforward. If you miss it, you can also do this in the yellow tab of the deep menu. And hit okay. Tap the shutter button to come out to our main shooting. So when you play images back, you can also pinch and zoom. I think this is a, a little bit more intuitive. And if you zoom out far enough, you can see the other pictures. This was me taking pictures of the camera earlier today on this memory card. And you can pinch and drag through your different images. Very nice, very intuitive way to get through it. And I'm gonna tap my shutter button to return to the shooting mode. One of the most common questions that I get on every Canon camera that I do a lesson on is, how do I get this level? Or how do I make the level go? Or how do I get this information to go? or I don't see what you're seeing on your back screen, make sure you have your camera in hand as you follow these lessons because you can, you can do what I'm showing you and it'll become second nature pretty quick. The first thing I want you to do is to cycle through your information screens. Just push the info button and know that there's a number of screens and that's how you get through them. The level's great. When you see this green, that means you're nice and even. If I were to tilt the camera down, you can see that the center marks become red because we're, we're not pointing at the, the exact horizon. And then when we get it lined up, those will turn green. And if I tilt the camera to a side, you'll see that it's not level. That's a very handy tool if you're trying to get set up for a landscape shot. The histogram is a statistical representation from dark to light. It's showing us a bell curve. And I talk about this on the crash course. There's a lesson on that on how to read it. There's tons of information here on the left and the right side. Sometimes we don't want to see it. Okay, we're going to push it here. And now we don't have any information. Push it again. The infamous black screen that I'll be talking about in just a moment. Push it again. Now we get the subtle settings here on the top and bottom. And then we get tons of information on the left and right. And that's how we cycle through it. Make sure you know how to do that. It should become second nature. In the top left-hand corner, of the viewfinder, we have the mode that our mode dial is selected to. And I'm gonna flip this over. Oh, this is another thing. See these little menus that we get when we're, we're flipping through the modes? That's designed to kind of give us a prompt and should try, try to tell us what, what it is this does. So sometimes we just wanna get into our shooting and I would recommend turning this off because I'm gonna tell you what these other modes do. This is called the mode guide. We can disable it and I'm, tapping the shutter button to return to shooting. Let's talk about some of the information that you're seeing. Put your camera in the M mode. In the first three settings I really want you to focus on are gonna be on the bottom of our screen, here, here, and here in the corner. And you're also, if you look through the viewfinder, you'll see something similar. This is our shutter speed. Anytime you see a fraction, one 125th, that is referring to the length of time the shutter is open. This is a measurement of how long we are letting light come into the lens and land on the sensor. When you see anything with an F, that refers to the diameter of the lens opening, how wide it is. Large F numbers are very small openings, teeny tiny, teeny, 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 tiny. Small F numbers are much wider. And so the wider the opening, the more light will be coming into the lens. Very important, we'll be talking about both of these a little bit later. The third setting over here is our ISO. And right now it says auto. For the sake of education, I want you to change this to something like 400 or 800 or 1600 because auto ISO is going to do a lot of work for you and I actually think it interferes with the student learning about photography. So set this to an actual number. A lot of this is going to depend on how much light you have, depending if you're in a bright room or a dark room, but for now let's just set it to 1600. What I also want to point out is that we have these little orange half moon icons. The one that is designated on the top refers to the front control wheel, and the one with the half moon on the bottom refers to the rear control wheel. So in the manual mode, we can change our settings using the front and rear control wheels. 
In this case, this will change our shutter speed. And in this case, this will change our aperture. For the sake of simplicity, I want you to flip this over to the P mode. And you'll notice that the shutter speed and the aperture disappear. If you tap the shutter button, you'll be able to see the settings again, but you'll notice that we lost this gray box. So you might be wondering, what is the gray box all about? When I flip it back to the manual mode and I touch on a gray box, it opens up a sub menu that I can touch and drag the setting in to change the setting directly without using either of these control wheels. So anytime you see a gray box on your monitor, you can touch and drag that setting left or right. And you'll be seeing this often in different places. We have a focusing box to magnify it. We have this touch shutter button above this that if we want to touch on the screen and take a picture, we can. I think it's kind of annoying. Or we can disable it. So what I want you to do now is go back to your P mode so I can point out some of these other icons and numbers. This guy here is referred to as the exposure compensation bracket. And I'll be spending about 10 minutes on this later. It's very important. To the right of that, we have our ISO. ISO is critically important to controlling how bright our images are. In the top, we have the mode that we're shooting in. We're currently shooting in the P mode. And these numbers in the brackets refer to the number of shots that we can write onto our memory card. I have a pretty big memory card on there, so I can write almost 10,000 images, probably much more. The number to the right of that, in this case 39, is how many shots in our buffer in a single burst can we get with our current settings. To the right of that, this is how long we can record onto our memory card. In this case, it's two hours, which is really, really great. And this last guy over here is the Q button. The Q button will allow us to access certain secondary settings that I'll demonstrate in just a moment. If I push the info button again, we see tons of information on the left and right. It's gonna go through to make sure we have everything. Again, here's our histogram. So let's go into the black screen. And I like using the black screen because the icons are a little bit easier to see. In fact, I can go back to the M mode again. These three on the top, we've already gone through. You should recognize them. What's this one right here? That's right, shutter speed. And this one, that's ex exactly right. That's our aperture. And we have our ISO here. And we have our exposure compensation bracket right here. So something you'll notice is that when we push the Q button, we also get this other interesting plus minus icon. This is flash exposure compensation. And then we get all these secondary settings on the bottom. Let's go through them one at a time. If I push the Q button and I use the directional pad to navigate, we can see that we get some information here on the bottom. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't tell us what it is. These are our picture styles. If I select it, we get all these options in here. Suffice it to say, picture styles are like recipes for JPEG. Auto and standard are going to be fine if you're just getting started. There's a portrait picture style, which is better for flesh tones. Landscapes have more vivid blues and greens. We have fine detail, which is tweaked for sharpness. We have something a little bit more neutral. We have faithful monochrome and some user-defined settings. For beginners, keep it on auto. You'll be fine for now. After that, we have our white balance. And in most cases, auto white balance is going to be fine. I'll be talking about this a little bit later in the video. We have our white balance shift in bracket, which I would say for now, don't even worry about it. Here we have our auto light optimizer, which is going to adjust some of the contrast that we see in terms of using P, AV, or TV modes. Here we have our Wi Fi or Bluetooth connection. This is our customized button controls. I'll have a completely different lesson on button customizations. Over here, we have our focusing clusters. When we select this, look at all the number of focusing squares we can choose from. And there is an additional tracking feature that you have to turn on with the info button. I'll be pointing this out a little bit later in the lesson. Next to that, we have our focusing modes, whether it's a one-time focus or a servo tracking focus, which is needed for sports. We have our metering modes. We have our drive modes. We're we'll talking about each of these individually a little bit later. And then we have our quality. So 24 megapixels, if we were to multiply 6,000 by 4,000, we get 
24 million pixels. And this tells us whether we're shooting in raw or JPEG slash high file, high efficiency file. There's also two forms of raw. There's uncompressed raw and compressed raw. Talking a little bit about those later. You can even shoot with both formats at the same time. For now, I would recommend the Jagged L if you're just getting started, if you're just learning. Something that's really cool about learning these icons and these symbols is that once you know them, you will see them appearing in different places. Here's the queue, another way to access the queue screen here without pushing this button over here. You can see it's kind of gray with white. We also have our relative battery life. There's a Wi-Fi indicator. But let's take a look at some of these other screens that we were looking at. This stuff, well, you should recognize some of these now. We've gone through them. So if we're in this shooting menu and I press Q, the way this works is it gives us those items that we saw on the black screen and a couple more on the left and right. And when we scroll through them and highlight one at a time, see this orange box. So that orange box tells you which menu item we're in. And in the bottom, we can choose different items from that one category. So here's the category and here are the items related to that category. So that's how that's what this means. You can you can select them directly with your finger. You can navigate up and down with the directional pad coming all the way over. I know I'm going fast. But here are our focusing clusters. We have our focusing modes. We have our image quality. We have our movie resolution, which we can set up by pushing the Q button. We wanted to have 4K 30, for example, it's ready to go. We have our metering modes. We have our still image aspect ratio. I would say leave it on three by two for now. I'm pushing down. That's the revert to the main menu. We have our anti-flicker shooting mode which is really for certain kinds of lights that flicker. Sodium-based outdoor lamps will do it. You'll see it in other cases. Basically, the color is different from shot to shot if you're doing a burst. Here's our white balance. Picture styles. We just went through these. You, you probably recognize them. Then we have these guys, the creative filters. I don't really consider these to be professional tools, but they're kind of fun to play around with. Fisheye, art bold, water painting, toy camera. If we come down one more, we get our subject to detect. So these are sets of software, and Canon has been improving them. For example, if you're a portrait photographer, the cameras are getting really good at detecting an eye. We want the eye to be in focus. Animals, all different kinds of animals. You know, there's tens of thousands of different species of animals on planet Earth. They all have a different face, right? We have different vehicles, or we can turn it off completely. And when we're ready to revert, we can press OK, or we can hit that revert to the main menu. So we've gone through most of the icons that you'll see in terms of shooting in a stills mode. Something else I want to point out is the information we see when we play an image back. So when we see a picture like this, we can scroll up or down. So this is a shot I took last week on the sister camera of this, the R7. And as I push the information button, I can see shutter speed, I can see the aperture, the ISO, you can see which number out of how many I have. If I push it again, we get the histogram, we can see the picture styles and the settings of the picture styles, we can see the quality of the image, and we can see the file size as well as the metering mode. Now it'll tell you to use this up and down, it's not referring to the directional pad, this is referring to the joystick, because if you hit down on the directional pad, it'll ask if you want to delete. We don't want to delete it. So I'm gonna use the joystick. We got our white balance. We can see the lens that was used. I'm about to put this lens on here now. It's the 24 to 105 F4. We get our RGB histogram. We get the focal length I was using. We can see the white balance shift in bracket. We can see the settings for the picture styles. The color space, the clarity, if I sent it to my phone. So there's a ton of information available for each image when you push the info button and you scroll up and down on the joystick. And again, I'm gonna tap the shutter button to jump out to the menu. Now having said all this, there is additional information when we go to the video mode. It's the camera icon up here on our mode dial. So I'm gonna flip this over to the camera mode. 
and you can see that the screen changes a little bit. We lose some of the top and bottom of the screen. It chops it off into a 16 by nine aspect ratio. Look at this, we get audio levels. So as I'm speaking, it's picking up the left and right channels on top of the camera. We have a video record button over here. A lot of these symbols are similar. This guy over here, Servo AF, tells the camera to focus continually. If you see that green dot, we have the ability to change how bright or how dark the image is, but we'll talk about this in great detail on the crash course. I almost always shoot in manual for video. But these other guys here, when we push the Q button, we have our focusing squares again. They're on the bottom. We'll be talking about them later. We have our video resolution. And if we go to the setup this time, we have tons of options. Real quick, obviously 4K deals with the 4K width, the number of megapixels wide. So if we come over and highlight it, we can see that it's 3,840. It's close enough to 4,000 pixels wide. So when I'm shooting for YouTube, I almost always shoot 4K, 30 frames per second. And then we have our compression. Standard IPB is a compression format that looks at the previous in the last image, figures out what's changed, and tells the camera to save space according to that. If you want 4K video with the intention to put it on YouTube, typically you're going to be right here. Some people will prefer to shoot at 24 frames per second. And something else you'll notice is we get the total record time for this memory card. I'm not a huge fan of the light IPB, but you can see that we get twice the amount of recording time. So if you're doing maybe a talking head video and you just don't have enough space, it is an option. Here we have a crop mode, which will actually put an additional magnification factor on the lens. For now, I recommend just shooting on 4K 30. Digital zoom, I don't really play with it that much. We have digital movie image stabilization. This is something else I don't recommend unless, I mean, there's no other way around it. What this does is it measures the shake of the camera and then it'll zoom in and crop out. You're going to lose a little bit of resolution. You can also do it in post. If you're in a situation where you're hand holding and you're walking and you, and you just don't have a choice to stabilize it, it is an option. I personally don't use it. Then we have our picture styles. We have our subject detection. And pretty much the rest is about the same. So that's an introduction to the different symbols and numbers that you'll see on the back monitor. There's a couple other things I want to point out is this guy right here is an infrared switch that's designed to be a battery saver. So the idea is that when we pick the camera up to our eye, it senses something close and it turns this back monitor off. There's a number of ways to customize this if you if you want to turn it off permanently or you know if I'm if I'm shooting on a gimbal it, it'll sometimes trigger this and I just want the back monitor working. So if that's annoying to you, and you just want to, you know, do your thing, so to speak, we would come up here and we could adjust these guys. So the way this works is that when you flip the monitor out, you can't really see this. I'll put it a little bit. It turns that monitor off. If we go to the second one here, then it, it works again. I know it's kind of hard to see, but it, it is over here. So this one means that once the screen's flipped out, the monitor will stay on even when you trigger the switch. Down here we have the viewfinder only, which is this little monitor inside here. If you select this, you'll have to look into this viewfinder to see, <laughs> to switch it back. And then finally we have the screen, which just locks this back screen. And so if you put your hand in front of it, nothing will happen. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna leave it on there for now. Hit okay. Let's talk about our ISO before we get into the exposure lesson. And something I want you to do is to pick a single focusing square so it doesn't cause any confusion. We'll just pick an, a single point so we can see that we can move the focusing point around. So make sure that you have your camera in hand because I want to demonstrate something about ISO. So I'm in aperture and priority mode. And I just want you to watch this so you, so you understand what's going on with ISO. And I'm going to turn my ISO down. I'm on a tripod. I'm going to turn it down to like 400. So I'm going to take a single picture. And we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at this picture. And we're using these white blinds. We have these nice, fine, detailed, sharp edges. Nice and clean. And what I'm going to do now is turn the ISO way up. Very high ISO. As high as it'll go. And I'm going to take another picture. 
And now when we zoom in, I want you to tell me what you notice different. We're looking at these fine edges. Look at all the salt and pepper in the grain. It's not smooth and clean anymore. You have a ton of noise. It's like a salt and pepper look. So the way ISO works is it's an artificial boost. It's essentially, the camera is capturing pure light, which is really determined by aperture and shutter speed. And ISO is adding this boost to it. And as we go into higher ISOs, that boost creates a grain effect. Back in the day of film cameras, we used different sensitivities of film. So if we knew we were going to be shooting in a dark situation, we would have higher sensitivities of film. And if we were shooting outside on a bright sunny day, we would have lower sensitivities to light. And that's what ISO is trying to do. It's the digital equivalent of film speed. And so the idea on this is that lower ISOs are going to require more light to expose. Higher ISOs would basically be used in low light situations where it's a little bit dark, maybe you're in, inside in a gym, then you're, you're going to want to bump your ISO up higher. It's not pure light, it's artificial light and the trade-off is grain. So if we're going to get very precise about what digital ISO is, essentially it's simulating more sensitive film, but in a digital sensor, it's not sensitivity, it's adding an artificial boost. Something to keep in mind as you are selecting the proper ISOs. Now we live in an amazing day and age where the ISO performance is actually pretty incredible and you can shoot 1600, 3200 sometimes in, in decent lit situations and you won't notice it. There are situations where you'll even have an ISO of 400 or less and you'll notice grain in low light situations and that's due to something else called shot noise. That's a completely different topic. I have a video that explains it on YouTube. So if you see grain at low ISOs, check that video out. For this next lesson, I definitely want you to have your camera in hand. I know most of you haven't done this, but we're gonna come into the deep menu just to make sure that your exposure simulation is on. Red tab, page nine, you wanna make sure that your display simulation is set to here, because otherwise this will not make sense. Let's talk about the mode dial on top of our camera. And I want you to turn it to this green A plus icon. So when we turn to the green box icon, which I call the dummy mode, it's offering to, to do these creative effects. We do not wanna mess with this and I would recommend turning this off so you don't see it next time. But there it is in the corner. Saying when you shoot in raw or C-raw format, you can apply the effects after shooting, that's great. It's trying to walk us through the controls and you'll notice the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, bracketing, our focusing box, everything's gone. This mode, the auto mode, the dummy mode, really turns your camera into a point and shoot. You don't have hardly any control of the camera and you didn't spend the kind of money you did on this camera for the dummy mode. So as your mentor, I want you to stay away from this as much as you can, as your, as your as your friend, I'm telling you, do, do not play around with the dummy mode. If you are going to do any kind of shooting where you're just nervous and you're worried about it, go to the P mode. Go to the program mode because then at least you will have some control over your focusing, your exposure compensation, your ISO, some of these other settings. But the mode that I want you to really push for as soon as you can isn't even the P mode. It's the aperture priority mode. And I always start with aperture priority mode because you can teach so many cool things about the camera in AV, aperture value mode. In the beginning of the video, I was talking about the selector button in the front, which I called the primary selector wheel. Primary because my index finger is numero uno. And my primary finger goes on the primary button. And my secondary finger, my thumb, goes on this button. So in aperture priority mode, you can see that the orange crescent mark is designating the primary selector, the front selector wheel. And what's happening is as I am changing the setting here, the aperture of the camera is setting right here, right? What these numbers mean is that smaller numbers are actually wider apertures. It's inverted. In smaller numbers, like this, 
is a much smaller opening of the lens. It lets in a lot less light. What you'll notice is that as I'm changing the aperture size from a wide opening to a small opening into a wide opening again, the exposure, which is a fancy way of saying brightness, isn't changing. Watch, I'll demonstrate it again. So a very wide opening, much smaller opening. The brightness of the monitor is not changing. How is that possible if we're changing the size of the aperture? So what we can do is we can tap the shutter button and we can get a preview of the shutter speed over here. It doesn't give us a box. We can't change it directly in aperture priority mode. But what's happening is, is that as we change the aperture, the camera is changing the shutter speed automatically for us. This is the heart of the matter with aperture priority mode. We dial in the aperture and the camera selects the appropriate shutter speed for the situation we are shooting in. Now, something else I want to demonstrate, it's very important, and I want you to do this at home, is as you tap the shutter button to make sure we can still see this shutter speed, I want you to take your hand and slowly cover the lens. And what you'll notice is the camera, these little tick marks are seconds, five second exposure, four second exposure. And so as I move my hand in front of the camera, you can see that the camera's changing the shutter speed. And this is also referred to as metering. The camera is metering how much light is coming into the camera and it's making suggested shutter speed changes. So the answer to the question is, that as I use a smaller aperture, the camera is applying a longer shutter speed to keep the exposure even. This is the heart of the matter with aperture priority mode. So we dial in the aperture, the camera handles the shutter speed. Now, I know many of you have the question, and this is gonna happen a lot, is that sometimes you'll be in aperture priority mode and it'll be a little dark for whatever reason, it's just a little dark. So the question is, is how do we make it brighter? And the answer to that question is exposure compensation. You can see the exposure compensation bar just to the right of the aperture. The short answer is that we will rotate the secondary controller just a little bit. Now you'll notice that nothing's happening. And I don't know why Canon does this, but this is like a preventative don't bump the camera thing. We have to tap the shutter button. So we see the shutter speed and we rotate it. Look, it's getting brighter. So here's an even exposure. And I'm gonna rotate it one little click. And if you compare those two images, one is brighter than the other. This one's brighter. And if I was to keep on, we wanna tap the shutter button. If I was to keep on rotating it, look how much brighter it's getting. And if I was to continue to rotate it, it's getting brighter. If I was to continue to rotate it, it's even, it's very bright, it's overexposed. Overexposure means it's too bright. If we went in the other direction, and I'm looking at this little tick mark right underneath on the bottom there, to one, now it's getting darker. A little bit further, darker still. Now it's very dark. This is called underexposed when it's dark. So I'm gonna rotate this back to the middle again. So that's the short answer. If you're in aperture priority mode, tap your shutter button and rotate the exposure compensation bar to the left or right to make it brighter or darker. You can also touch on the quick control here and we can just touch to make it brighter or darker. That's the short answer. There's a longer answer to this that I'm going to explain. What do these numbers mean? Negative one, that's a ne supposed to be a negative two, a negative one, and then we have like this diamond home plate and then we have a one, a two, and a three, and the three has a plus on it. So the negative is darker and the positive is brighter when we're in aperture priority mode. So what is the magic that's happening here? Again, I'm gonna tap the shutter button and I'll explain this. This is the longer answer. 1 80th of a second. And I want you to keep an eye on the shutter speed as I bump this up to plus one. Now it's 1 40th of a second. Each of these numbers represents something referred to as a stop, one stop. So this is one stop, two stop, three stops. So what is a stop? One stop is twice the amount of light 
as the previous setting. And it can prove it mathematically. This is amazing. Look at our shutter speed, 1 80th of a second. So I'm going to give it one stop of extra light. Now the shutter speed is 1 40th of a second. And that's right. When we do the math of this, 1 80th plus 1 80th is 2 80ths. 2 80ths simplified is 1 40th. So this shutter speed is twice as long as this shutter speed, and it's letting in twice the amount of light. That's what's happening with exposure compensation is that every number doubles the amount of light. So if I was to go to plus two, take a guess as to what this would be. 1 40th plus 1 40th is 1 20th when we simplify it. And if we were to go to plus three, take a guess. If you said 1 10th, you are absolutely correct. This also works in the opposite direction. Let's go and make it darker. So the shutter speed's going to be twice as fast or half as long, 1 80th of a second, twice as fast as 1 80th, right? 1 160th. So what would be another stop if we go to negative 2? 1 320th. And if you said 1 640th for the last one, you were absolutely right. This math doesn't hold up perfectly. The camera will sometimes round depending on shutter speed that we have when we start, but that is the heart of the matter of aperture priority and exposure compensation. The camera is measuring how much light's coming in. And if we tell the camera, hey, make it a little bit brighter, it's gonna cheat it with its shutter speed. Now I have to give you a very important word of warning is that when you're in aperture priority mode, it is very critical to sneak a peek over at your shutter speed as you are shooting. Handheld shooting, the minimum you should have is 1 60th of a second. If you're going with longer shutter speeds like 1 40th or 1 30th or 1 20th, there's a good chance your pictures are going to be blurry. In fact, to beginners, I often recommend that they go with 1 100th of a second. But 1 60th is pretty much more or less the limit of a normal person before they start seeing blurry images. And that's for still subjects. When we get into sports shooting, you may be shooting at minimum of 1 500th of a second or faster. It depends on the sport. A bird in flight might need 1 2,000th of a second. Now, I know a lot of you are unfamiliar with the basics of photography. The Canon R10 crash course comes with an introductory photography course, and I will walk you through all of these terminologies, and they will be the core foundation of your photography. But if you're just getting started and you're hand holding, you want this at least to say 1 60th or faster. If you're shooting sports, 1 500th of a second or faster, depending on your subject matter. Some of my students are shocked to know that when I was a wedding photographer, I would shoot in aperture priority mode for as a paid professional, making great money. And the reason is, is the camera does a lot of the heavy work for us. For example, you'll be shooting in a, in like a church that's dark. Here comes the bride and groom and you're, you know, you're walking out. Now you're in the foyer. It's a little bit brighter in there and you're trying not to trip, right? You're staying in front of them. You're walking back. Now you're outside and it's bright, sunny day. Well, those are three different lighting conditions and the camera will help you by using a faster and faster shutter speed as you're moving from one condition to the next. So my rule of thumb is if I am pressed for time and it's an event, I'm usually shooting aperture priority. I even shoot aperture priority for sports. If I have time or maybe I'm shooting in a studio with strobes and I, I can tweak my settings and refine them, I'm almost always shooting on manual. And for the most part, aperture priority and manual, probably like 95% of the time. On occasion, I will shoot in program mode if I am doing event photography with a flash, because that's the handheld mode for flash on Canon. It's kind of a different can of worms. But yeah, aperture priority and manual, 95% of the time I am on those two settings. That's why I'm really recommending that you start at aperture priority mode. Let's take a look at shutter priority, TV. It stands for time value. And you'll notice that as we switch from aperture priority to time priority, the control changes. We still get the upper orange half moon icon in our number one, um, numero uno finger. We're going to put it that on the primary selector. And as we change the primary selector, you'll notice now is that instead of changing the aperture, this is changing the shutter speed. 
So our primary selector is going to change the primary setting of the mode that we're in. And if I tap the shutter button, we take a look at the aperture, we can see that the camera is making adjustments now to the aperture. This is inverted of aperture priority mode. We dial in the shutter speed, the camera handles the aperture. If we were to take our hand and move it in front of the camera, the camera is going to try to open the aperture more to let more light in. I think shutter priority mode is great when you're learning. And as an example, let's pretend you are at your child's soccer game. And Michael said, okay, one five hundredth of a second. Let's dial that in. So we can dial in the shutter speed directly. Uh-oh, we got a problem here. Look how dark it is. But Michael said one five hundredth of a second or else it's going to be blurry. He said this. I know he said this on this YouTube video. But it's too dark. And when I tap the shutter button, the camera is flashing the aperture. Camera's not happy. When you see the camera flashing one of the exposure settings like this, it's complaining, saying, I cannot open the aperture wider than f4. We have reached the physical limit of the lens. That's what it's saying. So, as a photographer, if you were in this situation, what would you do? I want you to think about it for a second. We're locked in at 1 500th of a second. The lens will not open wider. If you said bump up your ISO, you are absolutely correct. And so we're going to come in and we're going to start turning this up until we can see the, about you know, the blinds. Let's try ISO 3200. And what that is doing is it's making the sensor, it's giving it a boost as if the film was more sensitive to light. And when we tap the shutter button, no more blinking. The camera is satisfied. What it's saying is, yeah, you can shoot at 1 500th of a second, F4, ISO 3200, and it's going to be exposed evenly. That's what's going on when we are in a situation where there's not enough light and we bump up the ISO. And this is how you could resolve the situation. I'm going to turn up ISO a little bit more to demonstrate exposure compensation. So if we're at 1 500th of a second and we want to make it a little bit brighter, you could turn it one little tick mark. And by the way, the individual tick marks in here are one third stop increments. Each time we go one click, that's a third stop. But you can see that the camera is making the change to the aperture, not the shutter speed. We go in the opposite direction, same thing. And that is how exposure compensation is working in shutter priority mode. Let's take a look at program mode. Program mode is good if you're nervous and you just want to go out and start you know, practicing your focusing. You don't want to worry about your exposure settings. Program mode is going to give us different combinations. And you'll notice that it does give us this orange crescent in the front. But the truth of the matter is sometimes you'll see some funky things going on. This isn't shutter priority mode. This is where the camera is is really going to give you different combinations of aperture and shutter speed based on your shooting environment. We can change the exposure compensation in a similar way, rotating the real control wheel to make it brighter or darker. And program mode is sort of like you're, you're taking the training wheels off a little bit from the dummy mode, right? You can change a lot of these settings. You can change your focusing mode. It's kind of nice when you're just getting started. If you're shooting events with a flash, you're going to use program mode. It's the handheld mode for flash with Canon. We can still change our ISO. We can come in and change our white balance or drive mode, the quality. We can change a lot of things in program mode, but the camera for the most part is going to be determining the pairs of exposure settings that we get. So there is a unique mode to Canon, the flexible priority mode, FV. When we turn this on, you'll notice everything is set to auto. The way flexible priority works is that you determine which of your settings you want. Let's put in shutter speed, the sports example. We need one five hundredth of a second. And the camera will then choose the aperture and the ISO. We could change either of these as well. So the idea on this is that you can determine which of the auto settings you want, and the camera will do the rest. I know people who love it. I don't personally use it at all. So I'm going to turn this back to auto. Try it out if you like, but I, I'm, I would still strongly suggest learning aperture priority mode and manual mode first. But I know a lot of people who love this. Let's take a look at manual mode. Manual mode is exactly what it sounds like. We dial in everything. 
We dial in the shutter speed with the front dial. Remove that. We select the aperture with the rear dial. We can dial in the ISO. You'll notice that when I put my hand in front of the camera, nothing's being changed. Manual mode essentially locks our exposure settings. In manual mode, to make the image brighter, you either have to use a longer shutter speed or a wider aperture. If you want to make it darker, you would have to either use a faster shutter speed or a smaller sized aperture opening. Now, something you're going to notice is that this, this bar is moving. And this is not an exposure compensation bar now. This is really a light meter. And it's giving us an estimation of the exposure. So if I was just to cover my hand, you could see it gets dark really, really quick. But it's not the same as the exposure compensation bar. And that's the heart of the matter with manual mode. We dial in the shutter speed, the aperture, and the ISO. Now, having said that, let's talk about auto ISO. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to turn this all the way over to auto. In manual mode with auto ISO, and there is a time and place for this, and the best example I can think of would be like a rock concert or maybe MMA fighting, mixed martial arts fighting. And the reason is, in those kinds of a situation, you may want to have a fast shutter speed to capture the action. You may want to have a very specific aperture, as wide as it'll open, but the lighting conditions are changing from second to second. Maybe there's lights changing or flashing on or off, and there's just no way that we can make those changes to our camera as the event is happening. That would be a time for auto ISO, where we're giving the camera permission to change the ISO settings between every shot, if it came down to it. And I know a lot of people who love it and use it in those kinds of situations, but in auto ISO, we're turning that control over to the camera and the camera is handling the ISO. We can also come in and set limits on this. Let's see if we can find it real quick. And our ISO speed settings when we select an auto range. So if you didn't want the camera to use a very high ISO, which would introduce a lot of grain, we could limit it here. And that's the idea of, of auto ISO. Now there is another setting in here that if you're in program mode or aperture priority mode where the camera is making adjustments to the shutter speed, we can tell the camera the limit, the, the, the slowest shutter speed it can use if we come into manual. And in this case, it's one 125th of a second if I was to turn this on. So this is going to apply to program mode and aperture priority mode. When we have our auto ISO turned on, it will set the slowest shutter speed for those two modes. Going to come back out, tap the shutter button. You'll notice that we have a couple other modes on here. One of them has a B next to it. B stands for the bulb mode. So in order to explain bulb mode, I wanna talk about shutters real quick. I want you to pretend this back monitor is the sensor of our camera. So there's two shutters that basically block the sensor from the light. The first shutter, when we're talking about a mechanical camera, opens, exposes the camera to light, and then at the end of the exposure, another shutter closes it and it resets. This is what a mechanical shutter looks like. It happens very quickly. It opens, closes, and resets. By default, many cameras are coming in such a way that it, it is an electronic first shutter curtain, meaning the mechanical sh shutter is up all the way. The first part of the exposure is captured with an electronic readout of the sensor, and it's followed by a mechanical shutter that closes, so it looks like this. And then a pure electronic shutter stays open, and it's just a scan or a readout of the sensor. Those are the three different ways the shutters open and close. Mechanical, electronic first curtain, and pure electronic. And there's some problems with electronic that I'll point out here in just a second. But for the bulb mode, the way it works is the exposure begins, the first shutter, will happen as we push the shutter button down all the way. And basically, as long as we're holding the shutter button down all the way, the exposure is continuing until we release it. This is what it looks like. See if we can get this timer here in the bottom. And I'm just soaking that sensor with light. It's gonna be white, it's gonna be blown out. But there is a lot of cool things that you can do with bulb mode. If you go down to like Las Vegas where there's lots of lights or maybe Christmas lights, and you put your camera on bulb mode and you use a smaller aperture and you turn your ISO way down, you can get some pretty incredible results by just taking your camera and shaking it around and capturing those really bright lights. It's probably too much information, but that's bulb mode and how it works. 
Something else you'll notice is that we have these items that say C1 and C2. The C1 and the C2 on our mode dial are customizable modes. Let's pretend you are a sports shooter and you're also a portrait photographer and you don't wanna to have to reset your camera up every time you do portrait or sports shooting. The idea on this is that you can set your camera up the way you like it, come into your menu, we'll come into custom mode and we will register the settings. The camera will remember all of your camera settings and not just your which mode you're shooting in, it'll remember your menu settings, your button customizations, all kinds of things to that C1 position. This way you don't have to redial it in every time. That's what the C1 and the C2 modes are for. And I'll demonstrate this on the crash course. I have very particular settings for certain types of shooting. And if you like them, then you would save them to those positions or tweak it the way you'd like. Moving on on the mode dial, I'm gonna turn it to the scene mode and just talk about some of these scenes in here real quick. The idea of the scene modes is that you tell the camera what type of shooting you're doing and the camera will try to help you as much as possible. And I don't really recommend using these because they can all be achieved by using the camera the way it was meant to be used. This is where the camera is trying to help you. Group photos. There are, however, a couple really cool features in here and one of them is the panoramic shot. It's sort of like you see on smartphones is where you take multiple pictures as you're panning across a wide view scene and it stitches the pictures together and it actually works pretty good. I'm actually pretty impressed with it. That's one that's worth doing. Sport shooting, it's better to do from your main controls. Panning feature is pretty fun. I will demonstrate this on the crash course using manual mode. I think it's a lot easier. We got close up. So the idea here is that the camera's trying to help you out but you don't have much control. Like for example, let's just come into the panorama mode. So when we're in the panorama mode and you hit the Q button, it doesn't give us a lot of options. We have our video resolution to change and we can make it a little brighter or darker, but that's it. And that's the same with all of the scene modes. If we come back in, they're pretty much more or less locking you out of the controls that you would want in terms of shutter speed, aperture. The HDR mode doesn't really work the way you want it to. It kind of looks a little bit fakey. And then we have the silent shutter. So what I'm saying is for the most part, with the exception of the panorama mode, I do not use the scene modes. So the two circles, the creative assist modes, if you come in and you can select the different modes here on the left, they're fun. I would say play with them a couple times, but I don't consider these to be professional tools because number one, you can do all these things in Photoshop or you know applying filters, but at least you know what they are. We have some HDR shots. I'll demonstrate this on the crash course, the different HDR types of images. I don't think they look really good the way they're processed, but this is what the creative effects are. Tapping the shutter button, and then we're rotating back to these other dials. Let's just take a quick look at the video camera icon. You'll notice that we don't get our shutter speed and aperture. I'm tapping the shutter button. It's telling me what they are, but I can't change them. So I highly, highly recommend this. Tap the camera icon and we're going to hit it on manual. So what this will allow us to do is to dial in our settings using a manual mode for video shooting. If you're vlogging, if you're doing a talking head video, YouTube videos, you're this is where you're gonna wanna be, especially with fixed lights. Now, as, an, as a primer to this, if you're shooting 30 frames per second, you want to double that and put it under one for your shutter speed. So 30 doubled is 60, under one, 160 for the second. And this is called the 180 degree shutter rule. The 180 degree shutter rule gives us the film-like look. So if we're shooting 30 frames per second, we're at 1 60th of a second. If we're shooting 24 frames per second, we're at about 1 50th, 1 48th of a second, 1 50th is closest. So that's the first thing we always dial in once we know our frames per second. If we're shooting at 60 frames per second, we wanna double that and put it under one, 1 125th of a second. Then we would set our aperture to what we want. And finally we tweak with our ISO. This is how I do every video setup. It always starts with shutter speed, then our aperture, then our ISO, and I usually use lights too. If you are shooting in rapid changing light conditions, you might want to go with this automatic mode because you don't have anything else. 
You can change the exposure compensation to make it a little bit brighter or a little bit darker. But for the most part, we're kind of locked out of the exposure controls. We can hit our Q button and change things like our resolution, our white balance, you know, subject priority, but we don't have the same number of options when we are in the manual mode. So this is the key for video shooting is we get the exposure setting controls in manual mode. Before we get into the focusing lesson, there's something I wanna talk about, this switch in front of our camera that says AF to M. I have the 24 to 105, L lens on here. It's an amazing lens. I've probably had four or five of these at different points in my life. All of them have been very sharp. I'm very happy with them. So that switch in front of the camera that says AF MF, autofocus to manual focus, those are for lenses, special lenses that don't have an autofocus switch on the side of the lens. This particular lens has this, so I can go from autofocus to manual by switching this lens. And if you do not have such a switch on your lens, this sh switch here should be that manual focus switch for you. If you have a switch, this other switch on the camera body isn't going to do anything when you switch it from AF to M. Something to keep in mind. I also get lots of emails from people saying, hey, my lens isn't focusing and it, it's they've just bumped their switch. So keep an eye on that. If your camera stops focusing, there's a good chance you probably bumped your autofocus manual focus switch. Let me put, a different lens on here that doesn't have that switch so I can demonstrate this real quick. So I went back to the Nifty 50, the 50 millimeter 1.8, and now when I flip the switch from AF to M, we can see that it jumps right into manual focus. And when I rotate the control ring, nothing's happening because it's on control. But when I flip this over to focus, then we can see the focus marker moving and it's telling us the distance from which the camera is focusing. So I hope this clears up any confusion about the AF to MF switch. It only works for lenses that do not have such a switch on the side of the lens barrel. Moving forward, I expect to see this switch on most Canon bodies because my suspicion is there's going to be even more lenses that do not have that MF to AF switch on the side of the lens barrel. Just keep in mind that when you do flip this over to MF, if you have a switch that has a focus to control ring, it has to be on focus in order for manual focus to work. By the end of this focusing lesson, you will know how to control, direct, and engage your focusing system in a number of different shooting modes. The way I break this down to my students is I tell them to remember the three parts, how, when, and where. If you can remember those three words, this is going to be a piece of cake. So how does the camera focus? By default, when we take it out of the box, put a battery in it, halfway shutter button depression will engage the camera's focusing systems. When we push the shutter button down all the way, it'll take a picture. In the case of the R10, we have some additional ways to focus the camera. We can also engage the AF on button. Pushing here, we get the green box, we can hear the beep. That is telling us the camera is focusing in this area right here. There is an even another way to do this by using the touch focus. Again, green box, camera's beeping. So we have three different ways to focus the R10, and that is the how. Now let's talk about the when, and this deals with the camera's focusing modes. We can access the focusing modes by pressing the Q button and coming up right here where it says one shot. One shot is what I've been demonstrating so far. It means that the camera is going to focus one time and then it's going to stop. We push the shutter button halfway down, the camera gets locked and it's going to stay locked. This is also true if we were to get a focus lock and then we were to move the camera. That technique is referred to as recomposing. It's very useful when we're dealing with still subjects and we want to compose the scene a little bit differently. So when you see that red box, it means the camera is not able to lock on something. But I put a focusing target up there, we get our focusing lock, and we can rotate the camera to recompose it while we are holding that shutter button halfway down. It's a very useful technique if you're in a hurry and you just want to make it more aesthetically pleasing. That is one shot. It's a one time focus and the camera stops. As long as we're holding it halfway down, the focus will not change. It's ideal for cooperating humans or 
still subjects like, you know, product photography, certain types of landscape photography, that is what you're going to want to go with. However, many of us will be doing sports shooting where we have small kids that run around. And in those cases, we're going to come into AF operation, which is the AF modes, and we're going to select servo. And I want you to watch and notice the differences. As I push a shutter button halfway down, we're not getting a beep. And we're getting a blue box now. So that blue box is telling us that we're in the servo mode. And the way the servo mode works is that it refocuses the camera over and over and over again. So as I'm moving that box around, it's refocusing on the blinds. You cannot recompose in servo mode because the camera is continuing to focus. Servo mode is ideal for fast moving subjects that require tracking, birds in flight, maybe motorcycles or cars or trains, people running, sport shooting. This is all servo mode because the camera will need to update the focus. And if you are in one shot trying to shoot sports, most of your pictures are going to be blurry because the subject's going to, going to be moving out of the frame. So that is the when, whether the camera is focusing one time or over and over and over and over again. Now there is a third time, I've already talked about it a little bit, and that is manual mode. This is when the camera is not focusing at all. There's no autofocus, it's not helping you. We have to use the lens ring to dial the focus in, and I'll be covering some manual focusing tools at the end of this lesson. Until then, I'm gonna turn this back to autofocus. So we've covered the how, we've covered the when, and now we are going to talk about the where the camera is focusing. This deals with what I call the camera's focusing squares. We can locate the clusters by coming, there's a couple ways we can locate it. You can come into your Q button and come right up here to the top left-hand corner, AF square. They call it the AF area. I like to refer to it as the clusters. Now there is a dedicated cluster button right here, but I, I feel like it's a little confusing to get to because you push it and then it wants you to push the MFN and then we get the clusters here on the bottom. Probably for now, it's easier just to do it from the Q menu. And there's even a faster way that I'll demonstrate on the crash course through button customizations, but you can see them on the bottom here. So the first focusing cluster I want to point out is spot AF. It's simply a very small focusing square. The, the size and the shape of the square doesn't change. We're just telling the camera to look in this one area for some contrast. And in this case, I have this tape. You know, it, it kind of struggles when there's no contrast. When you see that red box, that's a problem. Blue or green is where you want to be. Slightly larger focusing square. So we put the single focusing box over an area of contrast in the camera can identify it. What I'm doing is with this joystick is I am determining the precise precision of where the camera is focusing with these clusters. You can also do it by tapping and then engaging the focusing systems. And by the way, if you want to reset this to the center position, you push the joystick into the camera body and it'll jump to center. That's what that little dot is signifying in the one, in the one square mode. When we come to expand area AF, now we have a number of areas that the camera can look at. Now I'm gonna put my finger out here. Oops. There it goes. In this particular mode, it's giving a slightly higher priority to the center with the permission to look into these other four squares. We can continue to make this larger with an expanded area autofocus. Let's come over here. See here, no problem. Same thing, it wants to give priority to that center. Just to simply a larger square. Now these next three are the flexible zone AFs. Flexible zone means that we have the ability to control the size and shape of this by pressing the cluster button again. Then, so you can see it right here. If we push this, it gives us these controls in the bottom that when we rotate, we can control the size and the shape of this flexible zone. Very useful. 
For example, if you're shooting birds in flight, you may want to be more a little bit more focused on the center of the frame horizontally. And when we have this horizontal zone set up the way we like, and we engage focusing, you'll notice that the focusing square is grabbing onto the target. We're basically telling the camera, look within that zone. So if we go somewhere else, it's looking for the area of greatest contrast within this focusing box. This is really great for birds in flight when you're shooting against, let's say, a nice clean sky, but you want to limit it to a certain area. And if you want to change it again, you would come back in, get this set up, press the cluster button, and we can control the shape of it once again. Maybe you want it to go something a little bit more square. Really nice. And we get three of those to set up. The final focusing cluster is this one on the end whole area autofocus. It can be a little confusing because when you come out, you don't really see the focusing square anywhere. There's nothing to change because it's using the entire area. If we toggle our info button, we don't see anything. So some people will say, what's going on? But when you tap the shutter button down, you'll see in these the corners here, we get these little white lines in the corners. That's telling you you're using your whole AF. And in this situation, the camera is looking for the area of greatest contrast, and it also gives some value to something that's close to the camera. It's, there's probably more contrast on the tape. Let's see if it jumps on my hand here. Nope. Really, oh, there it goes. So it says, hey, I see a lot of contrast here. Let's see if it'll... Yeah, it's just really locked onto my hand. If I pull it away, it's back on the target. So that's the idea is it's looking at contrast and it's also weighing in the closeness, the distance. This mode would not be great if you were shooting, let's say athletic sports, football, soccer, where you have lots of people moving around contrast. The camera wouldn't know what to focus on. Another time this will be a problem is if you have a bird that's landed in some vegetation and you have like animal eye detection on. The camera will be looking in the bush for patterns of, of facial recognition. So it can be really confusing. The focusing modes in the squares that we use are largely going to be determined by the subject matter we are shooting. And when I say subject matter, I mean how that subject matter is moving. So for every different genre of shooting, portraits, landscapes, video, those are different fundamentals in each of them. And this is why the crash course is a great investment is because I just show you how to do it and how it changes. So that is the where, determining the focusing cluster and also choosing where we are going to place that specific cluster. Push here, press the MFN button. I'll, when we come back to the single point AF, we can move the joystick around, come back to center. And so for the basic setups, that is the how, the when, and the where. Now the R10 also has a number of awesome tools in here that I would want to demonstrate real quick. Canon has a great focusing feature built in to the R10 referred to as tracking. Tracking means is that the camera is looking for a pattern that it will recognize and it will automatically follow that subject. So you don't have to do anything. So what I've demonstrated so far is how the camera looks at, at things like contrast and distance, tracking, takes us to another level. It's part of the where the camera is focusing, but it recognizes patterns. And sometimes it's a little confusing as to when it's working. I'll show you face detection in a second, but it does work in both one shot and servo. But in one shot, we see it more specifically with something like face detection. So what I'm going to do is to show you how to turn it on and how to recognize it if it's working in servo mode. So we're gonna go to servo, and I'm also going to come up to our cluster mode. And when you see this AF area, right underneath it, it says info. It has a circle with some lines on it and it says enable. When it says enable, this is telling you whether it is on or off. So when you see it say enable, that means it is enabled. And this symbol that we see in other places will also tell us that it's turned on. Let me demonstrate that by pressing the info button to cycle through our screens. So when we get to our autofocus cluster modes, we can see that circle with some lines through it. We know that tracking is active. Now let me show you what it looks like. If I put my hand and my fingers there, I'm telling the camera to try to remember this pattern. 
So as I move that pattern around, it should follow it. It's having a little bit of a hard time. And this is the reason why I don't emphasize this a lot is that it can be tricked. When you have a nice clean sky, you know, or, or white or blue, and you have a bird flying across it, and there's a limited area of contrast, the camera might have a better time doing it. But the idea behind this is that we can teach the camera to recognize this shape or this feature and follow it around as we're shooting. Now you can see that I'm, I'm having a pretty easy time tricking it, but if you want to reset it, you would just lift your finger up and re-engage and it can refocus in its single square again. But the, the take home message here is number one, that you do have tracking available, that if you have a clean contrast, so a white sky with a single bird flying across, it's gonna work better. You also have this problem of sometimes that it can be confused. It's gonna come down to the subject matter that you're shooting. See, it's doing a great job of tracking this. See how it's staying locked on there as I move the camera around. It's going to depend on your subject matter, but that is the idea of general tracking if we're using servo with a focusing square. Now, if I come into the menu, and I go with something, like, let's say the whole area AF, same thing. We get a blue bounding box that is going to follow that subject matter around. This is obviously a very clean, contrasty subject. It's gonna be easier. This is not something you're gonna to wanna to do with, let's say, 22 people on the field running around. The camera's gonna have a much harder time with that, so you will have to judge when to use that. And if it's not suiting your taste, you would come back in and you would disable that. And you go back to your regular focusing squares. See our regular focusing squares, they're just looking for an area of contrast. We can change our clusters if I come into a square and we get back to this non-blue bounding box. So that's your introduction for tracking. Let's talk about face detection. We're lucky to have this handsome guy in here as a model. Eye detection has really revolutionized the way portrait photographers work because before eye detection was a thing, we would have to move the focusing square over the eye of our subject and, and in some cases hope that it was in target. And then we would take multiple shots just to make sure we had some keepers. It's completely different now. So what I want you to do is to change it to wide area autofocus just to demonstrate this, or we can go with the zone, that's fine. Let's go with that, with that square is one we had. And then we're gonna come into the menu. We're gonna go to the second tab. It's kind of a magenta color. And we're gonna make sure on page one, eye detection near the bottom is on enable. To demonstrate this, I also want you to make sure that your subject tracking is turned to on. Otherwise it'll look very different. Tap the shutter button. And what you'll notice is that we get a little white box around the eye of our subject. And we also get these two arrows to the left and right. So when I push on the joystick, I can select which of the two eyes I'm focusing on push the shutter button halfway down to get my focus, push it down all the way to take a picture. When I am shooting cooperating people, I'm very often in one shot. And that's what it looks and feels like. Eye detection has been a game changer because it has eliminated the need to get precise focusing lock through DSLR cameras. Eye detection works almost edge to edge of the frame. So we don't need to recompose. All we need to do is to engage the focusing systems and take the picture, and we get a higher number of keepers. So this has been absolutely amazing for portrait and wedding photographers. It's been great. I did, and, the, and the accuracy, I am so impressed with it, is that in the past, you had to have a certain size of the face for it to work. Now the faces are pretty small. I mean, you can get pretty far away and you can still get at least face detection. So definitely be aware of what this is and how to use it I typically set it up on my custom buttons where the star button is. So I just engage eye detection, boom, and I'm there and I don't need to fumble through all these settings. If you come into the menu and you turn off subject tracking and then you engage, you'll notice you get this grid pattern. It's where it's kind of looking at the face. So it's not really tracking the eye so much. It's recognizing a facial pattern, but I, I think this is far more, I don't know, convincing and more confident when we see that box on the eye and we get it. So that's the difference between using eye detection with and without tracking. Eye detection is fabulous. Now having said that, probably the second most common question I get is how come people are not getting 
100% keepers with eye detection. You will not get 100% keepers with eye detection. It's good. It's not perfect. And the funny thing about this is, or the interesting thing about this, is that we can come in and tell it to detect animals. So when we're shooting animal faces, you'll notice it'll still recognize humans. There are lots of different kinds of animals, and their faces and their shapes are all very different. And the algorithms are not perfect. So if you're getting 70 to 90% keepers, even 60 to 90% keepers on your eye detection with animals, that's really, really good. Don't be upset if you're not getting 100% keepers. Sometimes people will say, well, I had a bird in flight and I had face detection. I'm like, yeah, that's not how it works because the shapes of faces of birds are very different and when it's moving fast. So don't have that high of an expectation for it. But you can even come in and, and tell the camera to detect vehicles, things like cars and trains and, and things of that nature, or we can turn it off altogether. And when we turn it off, let's see what happens. Again, we go back to this pattern recognition, right? So yeah, face detection, eye detection with tracking, amazing. Let's make sure the info's on. It's a really, really great, powerful tool. Let's talk about some of the manual focusing tools. I am going to flip the autofocus switch to manual on the lens. And as soon as I do that, you can see I get a distance marker. So if I had a tape measure from the sensor mark, which is found here on the side of the camera, to our subject, we could measure the distance in meters. We can change this to be feet if we wanted to in the orange tab, I believe. Or we could just look at the screen and kind of eyeball it and try to get this right. But that's not what I do. When I'm dialing a manual focus, I use one of these following tools. You'll notice we have this magnifying glass. And I can zoom in to 10 times. And I can move the zoom in around with the joystick, right? Then I can dial in the focusing ring and I can get a very precise focusing lock right there. I do this a lot for video shooting where I want to get very, very precise focusing. And then I can zoom out, hit record. We do this a lot as videographers and filmmakers because we don't want the camera breathing, shifting the focus you know, randomly when things enter or exit the frame. So a lot of video shooting is done in manual. If you're a talking head or you're making a YouTube video, it does make sense to use eye or face detection, but we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about video. There are some other tools in here for manual focusing. Coming into the deep menu, page, let's see here. Five, manual peaking settings. I'm gonna turn this on to demonstrate just what this is. And so you can see it. We get this red overlay. I'm gonna hit info to make this stuff disappear. And you'll notice that as I change the focusing ring and we get sharp lines of contrast, we get this red outline. And that's referred to as peaking focus. And we can change the colors between red, blue, I think it's yellow. So here's a yellow. Depending on what your subject is, maybe easier or harder to see one of these overlays. Really, really great. Something else I need to point out is that if you zoom in, it disappears. Keep that in mind. There's another tool I don't use quite as much, but I did when I shot a film because it was one of the manual focusing tools that I had. And that is called the focus guide. When we turn this on, I'm gonna tap the shutter button. You can see that we get these little triangles up at the top here. There's three of them. There's one on the top and two on the sides. And what, what this is doing is it's measuring the distance based on contrast. And when they all turn green, you know that that is in focus in the area that you're looking in. I happen to have it on one of my eyes, but when they're lined up like this, you know it's in focus. It should be in focus. Turn that to off. So those, those are a number of different ways to manually focus the camera. Tap the shutter button, and I'm going to flip back into AF. Let's talk about focusing for video. I'm going to rotate to the video mode icon, and you'll notice that we have the servo AF engaged. This looks a little dark, actually. I'm gonna come in and bump this up. So screen brightness. Turn this up a little bit. Maybe that's even too bright. So the way this works is, especially in the case of eye detection, I have my eye detection turned on. You can come in here and, and determine it right here. It's still on. 
is the camera is going to track and update the focusing. That's what Servo AF does for us. Whether we're in tight, whether we're zoomed away, we could walk around. It's very smooth, it's very accurate. If you have one person in the video, it's what I recommend because it's going to track your face. You don't have to stay within the focal plane and it's going to update. It's not going to be distracting. It's a very smooth focusing system. If you're dealing with two or more people, there are different strategies to make sure that the, the camera isn't shifting its focus all over the place. And I will cover at least three different focusing styles for shooting people on the crash course. In this case, it's very useful, but there may be times that you want to turn it off. You just touch it right there. And now you are in a pause mode. So when we rotate the control ring, you'll notice nothing's really happening. All we've done is we've paused the AF. When we flip it to manual, now we're back in business. Peaking mode, all those things, they work here. Let's turn our focusing guide. Let's turn our peaking on just to see it real quick. So again, in video mode, very useful. And this is how you would dial in your manual focusing. Use it all the time. So there is another type of focusing. I'm gonna turn this back to AF, servos on, is I've moved the target closer to the camera. There maybe is about a foot and a half, two feet of separation between these two. And we have face detection on. In this case, if I wanted to shift the focus from one subject matter to another, and I demonstrate this extensively, I'm gonna turn that off, and I'm going to pick a single focusing square up here there so I have a single focusing point. When servo AF is engaged and I touch on the monitor, the camera will focus where I'm touching on the screen. In Hollywood, there is a person and their job is to change the focus as the director wants depending on the action or the scene. And we're able to do this without that extra person just touching on the monitor. So it's done in narrative film to shift the focus from one subject matter to the other. We're telling the audience to look here. And this is using the touch focus on the back with servo AF. It's another way to focus. Very, very powerful, useful tools there. It depends on what you're shooting. The strategies of your focusing depend on what your goals are, where you wanna direct attention, where you want the camera to look. So that is the how, the when, in the where of the focusing, as well as specific strategies and features for both stills and video on the R10. Let's talk about the drive modes. The drive modes are located here by pushing to the left on our directional pad. And as soon as we do that, they're listed here on the top. We have a number of modes. Single shooting is exactly what it sounds like. You get one shot. So if we have single shooting, it's like that. So these high-speed bursts are going to depend if we're using mechanical. High-speed continuous plus is about 15, and the one next to it is about six to seven. If we're using an electronic shutter, completely electronic, it's closer to 23 and about 15, and this last one is three frames per second. Then we have a timer. So if you're doing family shots and you wanna be in the shot yourself, you're going to need the 10-second timer. If it's something that you're operating and you're trying to minimize shake, you're probably gonna go for two seconds. And then we have this continuous self timer. And as I rotate the primary selector to the left and right, you can see that I can increase this number here. That's referring to the number of shots the camera will automatically take. So 10 second timer and the number of shots. And that, ladies and gentlemen, are our drive modes. It's what the camera does after we push a shutter button down all the way. And for these burst modes, you have to hold the shutter button down for the continuous burst to happen. Also, keep in mind that we will be limited by the buffer, which is typically indicated right next to it. So if we do a high speed burst and I'm holding the shutter button down, you can see that buffer clear very quickly because I have a very fast memory card. Let's talk about our white balance real quick. Now, the gist of this is if you are a pure beginner, Plain AWB, auto white balance, is gonna be fine for now. But what will happen is you'll go out and you'll be shooting and you'll notice the color of your images are gonna be a little bit off. Maybe they're blue or they're yellow or maybe even purple in some cases. And what's happening is, is that different light sources produce different color tones. Our eyes very good at adjusting to it, 
camera sensors are not so great. So these symbols that we're seeing here on the bottom for white balance, it's basically asking that we match this icon with whatever environment we're shooting in. So if it's outside on a bright sunny day, you would choose this, the sun icon. If we were in the shade, we would pick the shade icon. Or if it was cloudy, we'd pick the cloud and so on. Tungsten light is like a regular light bulb. We have white fluorescent lights. We have flash. We have custom light balance. We also have the Kelvin. So the short answer on this is that if you're shooting and you see these inconsistent color images, it's probably because your white balance isn't set correctly. There's actually a couple ways to manage this, but if you're an intermediate shooter, I would say match the icon to the situation you're shooting in. If you get into a situation where you're doing mixed light, you would set a custom white balance and it says menu to shoot white balance set. So I press that button and you can see this little custom icon here, just to the corner of it. I'm gonna take a picture of these white blinds and I'm telling the camera, this is what's white. I would do this a lot in weddings where, where we're shooting, you know, three different light sources, you know, where fluorescent, tungsten, and strobe lights are going off, right? So this would tell the camera that I am shooting in a mixed lighting situation and I want it selected to that custom icon. There's another way we can tweak this using Kelvin temperature. So when you select the Kelvin and you go to set color temperature, you'll notice that we get these Kelvin settings left and right. And this is part of the deeper answer, is that Kelvin is a measure of temperature. In very low temperature, Kelvin lights have a very yellow appearance. Think of like a candle light. Candle light's very orange appearing. So when we turn it down to, let's say, 2600, which is in the ballpark of candlelight, you can notice the camera is really cranking out this blue look. So what's happening is the camera is adding blue to what it expects a yellow environment to be. And that's what's happening with white balances. The camera is adding these colors to make the light appear white. Now, let's say you had a bunch of blue blow torches, which are much hotter than candles, right? You're in a I don't know, some sort of warehouse, and you have a thousand blue blow torches. Well, it's going to be very blue in there, and those are very hot. So, if we were to set the camera hypothetically to the blue blow torch color, it's going to add in a bunch of orange to balance it out. And that's what's happening with white balance. So, this Kelvin setting, as part of the longer answer, allows us to dial in the specific color temperature, and I know the lights I'm using are about 5,500. It allows us to dial in specifically the Kelvin temperature of the bulbs we're using. Now there's another hidden feature in there that I don't recommend changing. It's the white balance shift in bracketing. Here it is. So we can tweak the color in any direction of blue, green, amber, magenta. The vast majority of the time, especially on Canon cameras, I've never used this, not once. We can even bracket those images by rotating the rear control wheel, and we can take multiple in images with different color shifts. I wouldn't recommend this. So if you're just getting started, auto white balance. If you notice the colors are shifting and you're shooting stills, now you're going to start dialing in your icons. If it is an important shoot, shoot in RAW because RAW will allow you to process and recover a lot of these tweak files. There's a lot more information in RAW files, but I will give you a word of warning. Video is a form of JPEG. So if we're doing high-end video work, we don't have RAW video in the camera. It's a JPEG video. It's more critical to get the color balance correctly when you're shooting video. Again, if you're just getting started, auto white balance is going to be fine. As you get more serious on every video shoot, you will either do custom white balance or you do a Kelvin white balance. Let's talk about our camera's metering modes. Metering is how the camera figures out what shutter speed to give us an aperture priority mode. This is how light is measured as it is coming in to the lens. Now, something you'll notice is that as I'm moving the camera around, it doesn't really change the, the shutter speed so much. But if I come in, to the metering modes here, and I pick spot metering mode, watch what happens here. We get this little circle. If I tap the shutter button over here, 
it's giving me a recommended shutter speed of one 125 of a second. And as I, I move this circle over, watch what happens. Oh my goodness. The camera is saying we need a super fast shutter speed. In fact, so fast that we can't even manage it faster than one four thousandth of a second. So what's happening as I move this circle around? What's happening is we have defined a region that we're telling the camera to measure a light in. And I have this headlamp over here. So what it, what's happening is it's only measuring light from this little area. Even if I, if I put my hand in front of it, I'm able to trick the camera into using different shutter speeds. And then when we go over a very, very bright light, the camera's saying, this is way too bright. We need a super fast shutter speed, or maybe you need to turn your ISO down or something of that nature. So what's happening with metering modes is they are specific patterns that measure the amount of light coming into the camera. And in the case of spot metering mode, it's a very tight circle. If I come in and I can choose something like center weighted, it's a slightly larger area. Over here, it's 1 125th. We don't get the circle anymore, but as I get closer, it'll start recommending a faster shutter speed as I get closer and closer to the middle. It gives more weight to the center. Some of the other patterns include partial metering mode. We select this. It's kind of the same thing. We get a bigger circle. See that. And the last one is kind of like the all-purpose evaluative metering mode where it breaks the scene up into different parts. And you can see it's much more tolerant. It's measuring a little here. It's measuring a little here and here. So the advice that I would give you is if you are a pure beginner, start off on the evaluative metering mode. If you're shooting something that's heavily backlit, go for partial or spot metering mode. Those are good places to start. Let me give you some lens and accessory recommendations. One of the first accessories you're going to want to invest in is a tripod. I tell all of my students, try to stay away from the cheapy $50 Walmart tripods. It will work. The problem is, is that over time of opening and closing it, it will break down in I've ruined those within five months of getting them. Spend a little extra money, anywhere from $130 to $300, and invest in a good carbon fiber tripod, something that's sturdy, something that's tough, something that will last you for the life of shooting. I invest four or $500 per set of just the legs, just the carbon fiber legs. I like Bogan Monfrotto. They do have a lower, uh, more affordable version that's pretty good called the B-Free. And there are some other companies that have some decent tripods, but almost all of them are over $100. So keep that in mind. When I find a really good deal or a good tripod, I will try to put the link in the description. But again, stay away from the flimsy cheap models that you would pick up at like a Walmart store. If you're getting into video work, you're going to want to take a look at a couple microphones. The first microphone that I recommend to every beginning videographer is the Maven mic made by yours truly that was designed through extensive research. We did a poll where we had 400 people listen to several different microphones, and this was the number one microphone. It's tough, it doesn't need a battery, it's small, you can throw it in your camera bag, you don't have to worry about it. And if you start doing more video work, you wanna get something like a lav microphone, Rode makes a great little rechargeable Rode mic that you clip onto your lapel, or you can use a microphone with it. The microphone that I'm using right now is a Sennheiser E100. I think it's the fourth generation. It's amazing. And then I have a Journeyman mic, about another $300. Good lab mics are expensive, but this is the way to go. You wanna get the microphone pretty close to where you're speaking. And that's the secret with microphones is the closer it is to your subject, the better it's going to sound. And we clean up every bit of audio, even in this video there's always some cleanup that goes on. If you do any kind of landscape shooting, whether it's stills or video, if you are going to do a lot of videography, if you are a portrait photographer who's going to be using strobe outside to balance lights, if you're going to be doing long exposures, you're going to want to invest in a set of good filters. And I'm so proud to announce my Maven magnetic filter line. If it's not out by the time I launch this video, it will be shortly, and I'll put the link in the description for the pre-orders. We're gonna try to do it through Kickstarter. This is a magnetic, color-coded system that will allow you to identify your filters quickly, 
and put them on and off of your lenses in almost no time at all. That is the only filter system that I am recommending from this time forward. There are a ton of Canon EF lenses out there. EF is for the old DSLR mount. It's not for the new RF mount, and we can adapt those over, but I think most of you are probably going to be looking at RF lenses. It seems the trend is Canon is going more and more towards the RF mount, which is the mirrorless mount, and we're hearing discontinuations about so many EF lenses. So if you're going to be buying a brand new lens, probably recommend that you stick with the RF. The native focusing is going to be a little bit better in almost every case, and those lenses are also going to be designed to be very sharp because they were designed to be used with the R7, which has a very tight megapixel density. That's a whole different story. So I'm pointing most users towards the RF. The first accessory you are going to want to buy if you are coming from an EF system, meaning you were shooting with the Canon 7D or the 7D Mark II, and you have EF lenses already, the first accessory you're going to want to buy is an EF to an RF adapter. The last time I checked, they're in pretty good supply. They're $100 for the most basic one, and there's one with a control ring and also a drop-in filter adapter. I like the basic one and the one with the control ring. Now, the reason why you want this is because it's going to allow you to use EF lenses on your RF mount. This can save you a lot of money if you have lenses already in your arsenal and you want to use them. Now, the advice that I give for lenses is different depending on who you are and what your plans are. If this is your first camera and you don't see yourself investing in like an R5 or an R6 or another full frame Canon RF mount, you might wanna take a look at the two kit lenses they have that just came out for APS-C cameras. There's an 18 to 45 and there's an 18 to 150. I think the 18 to 150 covers a much greater focal length range. I think that's a better walk around if you're just going to get one lens for your camera and you don't have any full frame camera bodies. These are designed for APS-C sized sensors and the results that I've seen from them, so far they look pretty good, pretty sharp. Now, with that said, you will not be able to use those lenses on full frame RF cameras because the image circle projected onto the sensor is going to be smaller. And for that reason, I am tending to give advice more towards full frame RF lenses in the event that some of you do get an R5 or an R6 or even an RP or an R, those are all full frame Canon bodies. In the best of both worlds is to have a full frame in an APS-C. I think that's perfect for most advanced amateur photographers and even pros. In some cases, they're gonna wanna go with an APS-C for wildlife and sports shooting. If you are new to APS-C sized sensors, the take home message is that they're a little smaller than a 35 millimeter frame of film or a 35 millimeter sensor. What that means is we have to apply a crop factor which is a multiplication factor on the lens that we're using. And that factor is 1.6. So what that means is, is, is if I'm using a 50 millimeter lens, I multiply it by 1.6 and it behaves as an 80 millimeter lens, which is actually perfect for portraits. So I had a student recently ask me, why would I need to know this? And the reason is it's going to allow you to plan which lenses will give you which results on your camera. So if you're shooting sports and let's say you have uh, an, a 100 millimeter lens, it's going to behave as a 160. Or if you're trying to shoot wide angle and you're trying to use, let's say a 24 millimeter lens, well, you gotta multiply that by 1.6. It may not be wide enough. So having said all that, let me give you a couple lens recommendations, starting with those who are on a budget. I really like the 50 millimeter 1.8 from Canon. It's fairly new, it's a wide aperture lens. When you put it on, it is going to behave as an 80 millimeter lens, which is going to be perfect for shooting portraits. If you're looking for something a little bit more wide, Canon has a fairly new 16 millimeter 2.8. It's going to behave more like a 26 millimeter, but it's still fairly wide. $300, it'll work on both full frame as well as APS-C. If you're looking for a general walk around lens that works on both full frame and APS-C, there is a 24 to 105 kit lens. But if you have a little bit of money to invest, say just over a thousand dollars, I love the 24 to 105 F4. That is an amazing lens. I have used multiple copies of it and it has always been super sharp and amazing. If you're going to be doing sports shooting, 
wildlife shooting, rapid, you know, whatever kind of fast motion shooting you're doing and you're looking for a budget zoom lens, highly recommend the 100 to 400 RF. It's a fairly new lens. I own it. I use it. It's not the sharpest lens out there, but bang for your buck, it is more than enough. So I think that's a really good place to start because the 100 to 500 RF is a very expensive lens that's very high end. It is awesome if you're if you're going to be doing heavy shooting again designed for full frame cameras but the quality of the glass and the resolution and the sharpness it's going to be better than on some of these lower end lenses that's just i'm not ripping on anybody's lenses i'm just giving you the truth some other lenses that i would recommend if you have an unlimited budget is the 70 to 200 2.8 rf i own it i use it i love it it's amazing there's also a 24 to 70 2.8 rf and there is also an amazing 28 to 70 F2. It's a huge piece of glass. It's $3,000. They're very hard to find. It's one of the most amazing zoom lenses I've ever seen. Having said all that, just check out the Facebook group before you purchase a lens. Get some feedback from some other users. How do they like it? If you've enjoyed this tutorial and my teaching style and you want to invest in yourself to take this to the next level, Check out my Canon R10 crash course. I will put that link in the description. If it's not yet ready, it'll take you to my blog where you can leave your name and your email address. and We'll reach out to you as soon as it's finished. Thank you so much for sticking with me through this tutorial on the Canon R10. Have a great day and I can't wait to see you in our Facebook group.